Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 190. Science Faction Aurorin Tungenesis. Aurorin Tungenesis. Is this named after Utah Senator Orrin Hatch? No, it's actually named after uh, the Phil Collins band. <laughs> Genesis. No, indeed, this is the, another one of our hominids in our long lineage. I'm so excited that we've switched to hominids. This is uh, probably my favorite intro bit we've done so far. This particular one is only the second one we've covered because this is so far back. In fact, this is 5.5 to 6 million years ago. This species was first discovered in Kenya, so we're back to East Africa where we're supposed to be. We, uh, we commented on the last episode how we were in Chad where we were not expecting to find hominids, but this is where we're going to find pretty much most of the rest of the hominids in East and South Africa for the rest of this until we get up to the hominids that leave Africa. And this one is very interesting. It's very old. First discovered in 2000 and later most of the specimens, about 20, were collected in 2007. This is one of those ones that we're just discovering things about. You know, we've known about Homo erectus for over 100 years. Same thing with Neanderthals. This is a different type because this is so old that we only have a few tiny examples of it, just bits and pieces. We don't have a whole skeleton, though we can infer a lot from it. We do think it was likely bipedal. And what's really interesting about this particular species is, again, this is one of the more recently discovered ones, recently described ones, and it's old, but it actually looks more human-like, more homo sapien-like than a lot of the other hominids we have that come a little bit later on in between us and them, things like Lucy and the other Australopithecines, which suggests that maybe those other ones, those Australopithecines, might not be on our direct lineage because they actually have some more ape-like features. They might be a side branch, whereas our lineage, the homo lineage, may have actually come by way of auroran, or that, that led down a different line. We have things like uh, tooth size, which looks smaller, more like Homo sapien. We have things like the femur shape, smaller, more like Homo sapien. It would be unlikely that those would come to a point that look like Homo sapien, then go more like an ape, and then back to looking like Homo sapien. It's more likely that our lineage came directly from this auroran, and the Australopithecines are a side branch. So very, very interesting, and it's interesting how these new fossil discoveries can actually change the way we think about other fossil discoveries, because we've known about Lucy for a long time, we've known a lot about Australopithecus for a long time, and we've just kind of assumed they were our ancestors, they were somewhere on our lineage. It looks more and more, due to discoveries like this, that they might be a side branch. This might be a stupid question, but... Probably. Would it be unsafe to assume that a Kenyan bipedal hominid was also great at long distance running. Yes, he was almost certainly good at long distance running. You know, it's funny as we joke about that, that is actually what makes human beings special, almost more than our intelligence or upright walking, because our ability to run long distances is actually how we made our way in the world for a long time. Think about it, we're not particularly large or strong or fast. We don't have good offensive weapons, no good claws, no good teeth. But we do have a prehensile penis. You're thinking of dolphins. That's that is the one. Oh, you're okay. The, yeah, we don't we don't no, have anything. No. Also, octopi. Yeah, I think they have them as well. Um, you no. Know, so what we would do is we would find an animal and just run it down, quite literally, because human beings are some of the best long distance runners in the animal kingdom. So we would find something, uh, you know, throw a couple spears at it. If we didn't hit it, just keep chasing it. Chase it. Chase it. Chase it. A wolf might outrun you in the short term, but you can actually outrun it in the long term just by slowly running it down until it gets tired. And that's likely how human beings made their way. So there is something innately human about that long distance running. It's because we don't have fur coats uh, on at all times, mm -hmm. so we don't overheat. Yeah, well, that's part of it. That's actually one of the ideas as to why we have lost a lot of that fur is, you know, you keep it on the top of your head to block yourself from the sun, but everything else you want to be able to, you can cool down. That's also why we have a different cooling mechanism than most species. We sweat as opposed to just getting our heat out through panting. And we've kind of evolved into this creature that is specialized for long distance running, even almost more so than intelligence, we're specialized for long distance running. Are there any thoughts on how, are there any thoughts on how the long distance running factor correlates to uh, our migration patterns? Because there aren't many species that have migrated the same way that humans that's have. A, that's either. a good point. You know, one of the things is long distance running plays into it as well as the intelligence and tool making because we have the ability to go into different environments. Most animals are specialized to one environment. If you're a savanna animal, for the most part, unless uh, you have some major evolutionary changes in your lineage, you stay a savanna animal. 
humans are different because we're the only ones who can come from the savanna and then in the same generation exist in northern Europe with the advent of clothing and bone needles that allow you to stitch things and fire and things like that. We use culture to help us adapt to that spread, but undoubtedly we wouldn't be able to range as far and fast as we do without that history of long distance running. I have another question. You said that humans are uh, the best long distance runners mm -hmm. in the animal kingdom. Pretty much, yeah. Is that why humans win almost all marathons? That's why we win most marathons, because for a while we had a, a lot of competition from ducks. We're so, not counting the Iditarod? Is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they need a bunch of them, and then those lazy dogs have to rest a bunch. And <laughs> Granted, they are pulling us around. Yeah, well. <laughs> but there's like 12 of them. And speaking of lazy dogs, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist, or Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. Thinking about getting into the Iditarod, because I, too, am husky. <laughs> that is very, very true. And our scientist for the evening, Ian. Ian, how are you doing? Not too bad. All right, good to have you back, Ian, here at the Madhouse Comedy Club along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego. Come on out and check out the Saturday Night Lineup at Madhouse. And when you're not doing that, check out our website at www.thesciencefaction.com for all the articles we cover here, as well as some we don't. And also, as of last week, we have started putting links to some more information on our intro bit up there, too. So if you ever hear about one of these hominids that you're interested in and you want to hear more information about, just go ahead and go to our website. You can look at uh, Sahelanthropus chadensis up there from last week, or you can look at Aurorin up there from this week. And if you want to, go ahead and check out the video section for coverage of our Flat Earth debate. But for now, let's go right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. Great timing on this particular article. It came out, it rocked the scientific world, and it could not be more perfectly tied to our intro bit. This week... The Cretan hominid footprints discovered. I'm like wincing right now for a verbal assault. Like, like it was like Bobby physically raised his hand. I'm waiting for an insult. <laughs> yeah, as, I'm as super excited. I, I am the Cretan hominid. You <laughs> get out of here, you Cretan. Yeah, indeed. We have found what appears to be ancient hominid footprints in Crete. Now, there's a bunch of things that are super interesting about this. One, Crete is an island in the Mediterranean. Number two, these hominid footprints are 5.7 million years old. This is back in the Auroran times, which is why it's very appropriate for our particular intro bit this week. Did this hominid have a head similar to that of a bull? <laughs> it did not. It was not a minotaur. We also don't know what it... I mean, it could, actually, because we don't know what its head looks like. We just have footprints. We don't even have remains. It's, well, it's wait, very wait. unscientific to just work in absolutes. It's, wait, wait. Didn't uh, the minotaur have hooves? Yeah, yeah. Yes, he's right. Maybe he found a pelvis. Now who's unscientific about their minotaurs? <laughs> <laughs> what an ass I am. Yeah. Uh, no, so there's a couple things that are really interesting. One is these footprints seem to show good bipedal locomotion, and it seemed to be directly hominid feet. And when we say hominid feet as opposed to old ape feet, so ape feet have a thumb, essentially, like we have in our hands. Their big toe is kind of uh, pointed out to the side of their foot as opposed to pointed in line the way our toes are. That has to do with how you walk. And for a long time, we thought this, at least hominine, the difference in hominine footprints from ape footprints is where that toe is and how you walk and, and the whole nine yards. These footprints look very, very much like a hominine, all the toes straight in line, facing forward, and this actually should predate, at least from what we currently think, this type of walking. We didn't think that any creature was around walking at this time that, looked, that had footprints like this, and even if we did, we certainly would not have expected to find them in Crete. We would have expected to find them in either East or South Africa. So this is a very, very interesting discovery. Did they also find evidence of hominid democracy? No. And a love of young male hominids. Oh, you're thinking of the Greeks. Okay, I, I got you there. Uh, no, so these, this, is, this is super interesting. It's, it's in a place we wouldn't expect it. Now, a couple things to clear up. This is at a time, 5.7 million years ago, where the Mediterranean is not flooded the way it currently is, and instead of being an island, Crete is actually directly connected to the Greek mainland. And this is also a time when the Sahara Desert did not exist. And so essentially, you did have a continuous area from East Africa all the way up through the Middle East into Southern Europe that a hominid could be ranging. That is still very surprising because we still didn't think that we had hominids leaving Africa at least for another 
four or five million years, so this is a huge deal. But secondarily, it is interesting to see that whatever hominid did this seemed to have a very modern walking gait. We would not have expected that based on the fossils we see. Now again, we talked about Aurora earlier. We don't have fossils of his feet. We don't know exactly how he walked. This could be an example of Aurora. This could be an Aurora to Genesis that made its way up to that area in Southern Europe and is walking around on this beach. Very, very interesting. I always like these kind of remains that we find too, because again, these aren't the fossilized remains of an individual. This is the fossilized remains of their footprints. We have this in Laetoli at about three million years ago when we see an Australopithecus walking across some ash and that later became fossilized and we now have a record of that. Very, very similarly, this is somebody, this is an individual who's walking along a shoreline. And, you know, I, I mean, I guess Jesus was carrying him <laughs> because there's one set of footprints uh, that then got <laughs> filled in. And Give me to that joke. And you might say, like, okay, well, how, do we, how can we be sure? How do we know maybe this isn't just a few thousand years old? Actually very interesting and very well dated. They're actually dated by multiple methods. One is actually looking at the marine microfossils that are in the area, because again, this is a shoreline. We know when certain animals existed. We see their microfossils in this same layer. We know when it is. The second one, though, that's even more airtight, because it's, there's less likely of an intrusion, is that they're actually underneath a sedimentary rock layer that formed when the Mediterranean completely dried out 5.6 million years ago. So we know it has to be just slightly older than 5.6 million years based on the fact that we have a distinct layer that formed right at that time period. So very securely dated. Type of walking we did not, absolutely didn't think existed back then, probably didn't think existed for many more millions, millions of years in a place we would have never expected. This is huge news for paleoanthropology. And unlike a lot of the buzzword stories you see on a lot of those sites, hey, look at this, we found these old fossils, this completely upends things. This really does change a lot of the way we think of human paleoanthropology in the region. Maybe not this example. Are there any scientific examples of a hominid that walked with, you know, some pep in its step, with a little style, a little pizzazz? So what you're asking is if there was uh, like, a, like a huggy bear hominid that was walking down the street with the strut that kind of got all the attention of the ladies? Yeah, could you, could you like tell if they had like platform shoes with goldfish in them or something? Yeah, I mean, we're scientists, Damien. We can tell when somebody's got a pimp walk. That's uh, <laughs> human paleoanthropology 101 right there. Plus, the hoe train footprints are right behind him. <laughs> That's right. Uh, super, super interesting stuff. I can't wait to see what else we find in certain areas like this, because usually what ends up happening has happened in southern England before. You find the footprints first. You later find site locations with tools or something else that relates to that particular individual. If we can start finding hominid remains of this type outside of Africa in this really, really interesting modern way, it might upend things. It might even change, theoretically, though most of the evidence is still in the other direction, where we think parts of the homo uh, genus came from. Some of the homo genus might, in this sense, might not have developed in East Africa if we know we have this bipedal walking, very homo-like creature walking around in Crete 5.7 million years ago. This could literally change where, a lot, where we think a lot of the story goes and takes place. I remember I was on the news once in high school, and I was described as a very homo-like creature by the newscaster. Yeah, I, he, he was kind of a bully, huh? Yeah, it was really offensive. Looking back, I mean, didn't age well. Now, uh, how would this, you know, given that this was found in southern Europe mm -hmm. and Neanderthals are known for being in northern Europe, mm -hmm. would there be any connection there? Well, or? Neanderthals are actually all over. So we have Neanderthals from the far, far west coast of Europe, all the way to Gibraltar, quite literally, all the way up through northern Europe, southern Europe, Middle East, and all the way into Asia. So we have an entire range of those. Neanderthals come from the same lineage we did. So if this is on our direct lineage, it's on theirs as well. You know, we split from Neanderthals around 600 to 700,000 years ago. So you know, th if this was our ancestor at 5.7 million years ago, it means it's just as much theirs. And now, is that still, because when you were talking about Aurora and you were uh -huh. talking about how the lineage might have split with Australopithecus, right. is that still what you said true for Neanderthals? What do you mean? Well, so you said that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are on the same direct yes. lineage. Does that change at all if Aurora is perhaps a, our branch as opposed to Australopithecus? No, no. It was, we definitely only split from Neanderthals about somewhere between actually 400 to 700,000 years ago. And we know that from genetic evidence. So no matter what, that won't change. And if we turn out that our lineage was directly from Australopithecines or Aurora, and because it's so far back, we share that no matter what. You know, it's kind of, for those of you at home, thinking about like your cousins. 
if you uh, start saying, if you start talking about your grandpa or your great grandpa, you know, you go back to a point where you guys both meet, you converge, your family trees converge. If we're talking about our great, 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 great grandpa, and I'm talking about me and my cousin, you know, we're both equally related to that guy. This is the most appropriate thought I've ever had about my cousin. <laughs> I was just say I, I imagine uh, Damien's family tree probably merges a little sooner than most. Yeah, it's it's more of a, a congealed web of goo. It's like a plate of spaghetti. Damien has a spaghetti family tree. Yeah. All right, on to article number two: the mysterious British gas invasion. This is a super, super interesting article. You guys might have seen little tidbits about it. I'm still amazed that they're getting away with this, and I have a few theories why. We'll talk about this uh, after we talk about what the actual thing, the incident was. A couple weeks ago. A bunch of British people are sitting on the beach in the, at the Burling Gap, which is kind of a across from, from the continent, and they're sitting there hanging out, and all of a sudden this gas creeps in. And people don't really think much of it. It's Britain. Things are foggy all the time. You know, who, who knows? And then all of a sudden, people start getting sick. Their throats hurt. Their eyes burn. Some people have, start gagging so much that they start vomiting. And all they can say is it's, starting, it's from this gas. People describe it as smelling like burnt plastic. Smells like burnt plastic, it does. <laughs> they run home. I just ran home. They, they're told by the police to shut all the windows and doors and try not to breathe in any of the gas. Police told us to shut the windows and don't breathe in any of the gas. They did. And no one to this day knows what happened. And it's really interesting because nobody said, okay, well, it turns out there was a boat that went by that had a, an engine fire or something like that. Right now... As of now, we don't know what the gas was. We don't know where it came from. We don't know what caused it. We don't know if these people have long-term damage. All that they can say is the Sussex police came out and were like, eh, you're probably fine. This is probably the least damaging thing about your lifestyle in South London. <laughs> well, it's not South London, by South the way. South England. But uh, the gas lasted for about three hours and then dissipated. And to this day, there is no explanation. All they've said is, because a few people were thinking maybe it's chlorine gas, uh, and all the re reports seem to say probably not chlorine gas based on some symptoms and other things. They also don't think it came all the way from France, you know, all the way across the channel. But they don't know what it was or where it came from. I find this insanely fascinating, not only from a science mystery standpoint, it's almost like those old unsolved mystery shows, you know, like all of a sudden a cloud of, cloud of gas comes over the beach, people start vomiting, nobody knows what it is, no, no, nobody's saying anything about what happened. This sounds like James Bond diffused a supervillain situation right. right there on the beach, and he slipped away unnoticed. Well, here's my thing. This is the difference between British people and American people. This would be top-level news until they figured out what's going on. People, if this happened in L.A., if, somebody, if a bunch of people were on the beach in L.A., and a cloud of gas came starting to cause people to get sick and vomit, and the only thing the LAPD said was, eh, hey, you're probably fine, people would be throwing a shit fit and rioting right now. Are the British less prone to conspiracy theories than we are? Is there just that, le do they trust the government that much more? I just think they have that whole stiff upper lip mentality of like, well, yep, you got gassed. World War II left a deep scar on the psyche of Britain. They're just, they complain so much less than we do that they get gassed in one of their public beaches and nobody gives them any explanation whatsoever, no reassurance as to whether or not they'll be good, nothing about like, you can't have kids anymore, or you better watch out for, for uh, pregnant women, nothing. They just go, hey, you're probably fine, and everybody goes home and fucking accepts it. Well, to be fair, it didn't interrupt a soccer match. Yeah. <laughs> Football. <laughs> Sorry, my mistake. Very, very interesting. One, I, it should just be a sociological experiment that we study for the next hundred years in terms of those who complain and those who do not. But two, I think it'll be interesting to figure out what it finally is in the end, like if they come out and they're like, oh yeah, simple explanation. Uh, a cargo ship had a, a shipping container full of chemicals that fell into the water, it reacted in a funny way and created a gas. You know, this is what happened. I wanna know what happened, how it created that much gas, because think how much gas it takes to overwhelm an entire beach in a beachside town. It's a significant amount. This has to be a major chemical reaction. And it's not like if this was just a natural thing, we wouldn't have seen this at some time before. So we have to figure out kind of what's changed and what's, I always love those kind of mysteries. How do we figure out what exactly happened? But then also the, the broader experiment, the people watching experiment of understanding how chill British people must be. To be fair though, do you think that's why America dominates the sciences now? Because people, people in Britain don't wonder what the fuck just happened. America keeps crying until a smart person figures it out. Maybe, maybe. I feel like they do still wonder. They just do so very politely and without urgency. They're just like wondering, oh, maybe, well, let's go investigate this properly. I, I do wonder, though, if it could possibly be some leftover munitions or something, because it is almost on the very southern tip of England, right. closest to 
uh, France. But, you know, what kind of munitions would... Uh, they weren't Chemical. dropping gas bombs, you know? So, like... It, and then what would last for 50-some-odd years, six, 70 years now? Well, I mean, if you think if it's in a, a case, you know, a shell case, or, right. you know, then it could last for that long in the water. I and then if you have a sudden release, you know, yeah. it rusts through finally. But, yeah, I mean, it's not like it was World War One, Right. But, I mean, still, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's a weird thing to think about and then also a weird thing to try and say, why can't we match these symptoms really quickly? You know, why, also, why wasn't there somebody who took some kind of air sample? Like, how is this such a mystery in 2017 that we can't immediately solve this with a mass spectrometer? Maybe somebody uh, was vacationing on the beach mm -hmm. and brought uh, a foreigner and brought a bunch of uh, sriracha or some sort of hot sauce mm -hmm. and the bland English palate didn't know how to interpret uh, uh, this, this sensation hitting them. Or, it, or maybe the band foreigner was vacationing <laughs> and they brought with them a jukebox hero. <laughs> That's cold as ice. Uh, You're making I, me hot blooded. This, like entire, <laughs> this entire thing was caused by one guitar. <laughs> All right, let's move right on to everybody's favorite game. I call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. All right, I call BS is the game where I read four science news articles, and my panelists compete to see which ones are real and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Of course. Yes, um, and no Ian, I got to warn you. No rule changes? Yeah. Ian, I, I should, so Ian, if you've forgotten, because you've been gone for a while, it's good to have you back. If you've forgotten, uh, so the way this works is usually Damien, actually I think every time he loses. He's, he, I, I'm pretty sure he's lost essentially every time we've played this game. I am on such a winning streak right now, because we've had Seb on several times, and he has been on a losing streak. I think he, I, I, this is either my fourth or fifth victory. I don't believe row. that's true. But regardless, uh, if you guys want to play along at home, again, you can comp compete against Damien. He's always easy to beat. He seems to lose every single time. And then you can tweet us with uh, how badly you beat Damien at Faction Science. Just uh, send us a little tweet. I beat him by three points, one, whatever it is. You know, it's really easy to do, but go ahead and brag a little bit. I think our fans would like to see you demean me more on Facebook. If or... this was like a fantasy football draft and you only could pick teams, Damien would be like the Cleveland Browns. Like just one team. It's a very unexciting fantasy football league. And I say that as a guy who's not a fan of fantasy football. All right. Let's start with article number one. A new study confirms that humans are unable to perform echolocation without mechanical assistance. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. You don't need mechanical assistance. You could have a trained dolphin or bat assist you. Okay. So you just carry, you carry a dolphin around? Well, you'd ride the dolphin if it's a sea situation, uh -huh. but you'd have a bat on a leash. <laughs> like a kite? You would carry a bat around over the... Okay, fair enough. So you could get the air and the water. Listen, people walk around with hawks. I mean... Do they? People yeah, walk, a lot of people with, walk around with hawks? I, I haven't seen that. Yeah, like, like uh, there's falconers, but then for the more badass, there's guys who work with hawks. Okay, so that's like, they just walk around on their, in their daily lives. Are, are you well, talking about... They other? hunt with it. They're, they usually ride horses <laughs> and are doth rocky. All right, and Ian. So I'm also caught up on the mechanical assistance part, but a slightly different angle than Damien, because I would expect it to be electronic or electrical, potentially. Uh -huh. So I'm going to call BS. All right. Article number two. One of the oldest human remains in the New World, the remains in Tulum, Mexico, have been confirmed to be 35,000 years old. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science, but I mean... This is for the same reason I always cite, because if this was true, uh -huh. you'd be masturbating to it in the article section. Well, to be fair, we had a really good article to start it out with, so it might have, might have bumped it up a little bit. But we, fair we could have bumped British gas yeah. for this. If yeah. First of all, you never bump British gas. That's a rule. It's rude. Yeah. And Ian. I'm also going to call BS. All right. Article number three. Researchers are baffled at the first documented case of a homeopathic magnetic hematite healing bracelet purchased at a market in Manchester, Connecticut, actually helping to cure a disease. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. This is not the first documented case of a homeopathic bracelet curing a disease. This is the first documented case of a vaccine preventing a disease while at the same time not causing autism. Oh, okay. That's never happened before. Not once. No. I, Damien, I'm autistic as fuck. Yeah. And, and look you, at you. And you have polio. <laughs> and Ian. So earlier, I think it was this week, I read something about a, uh, somebody getting lead poisoning from one of these bracelets. 
So I'm going to call BS. All right. You and have a fucking original answer. Quit copying me. This is bullshit. I want him to go first next time. <laughs> Damien's complaining about losing just like he always does. And lastly, article number four. New research indicates that the most nutritious part of the avocado is actually the stem. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. The most nutritious part of the avocado is the rest of the burrito. Oh. <laughs> There's more calories in the rest of the burrito than in the, that avocado. We're going to need to talk about nutrition means later. All right, and Ian. So I'm going to call this science partly to have some differentiation between Damien and myself. I don't want to be too much like him. And also, I know that avocados are actually very high in fat. That is true. So maybe it has something to do with the stem is more fiber and less fat. I don't know. All right. Let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. A new study confirms that humans are unable to perform echolocation without mechanical assistance. Both of you guys thought this one was false. And this one is bad science. In fact, not only can humans perform echolocation and blind people can actually teach themselves how to do this, they can actually do it so well that some can actually ride a bicycle. Completely blind people can ride a bicycle using echolocation and they do it with a series of clicks. You can watch this 60 Minutes at a great special on a guy who does this and they literally do the same thing that dolphins and bats do. They go and they do a click and they get the sound back and they're able to kind of see the environment that Are way. Are they sure that this wasn't just Daredevil? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he was in a lot of toxic waste. Is this why the best martial artists are usually blind? Uh, that's not true, but <laughs> what this particular study did, and it was actually two different studies, they wanted to look at these clicks they make to see how they vary acoustically from normal human speech, and they found out that they actually do vary quite a bit. They had a distinct acoustic pattern that was more focused in its direction than human speech, which is just kind of spoken outwards. They were actually able to direct this particular acoustic pattern in a certain direction, and the clicks were brief, about three milliseconds long, with the strongest frequencies between two to four kilohertz, and some super strong frequencies up at 10 kilohertz. That allows them to get a better resonance back and allows them to get a better picture. So they're shooting the, the waves at the objects that reflect back and can be heard best by the human ear. Kind of what we'd expect, but very, very neat to see that people have perfected this technique. And if you ever watch somebody do it, it's really impressive. So does having a service bat, an echolocation yeah. service bat, ultimately healthy for the blind person or not? Does it, does it weaken their other senses because they rely on the bat too much? Yeah, I would say you wouldn't want the service bat as much because if you wanted to get an animal, you want to get the service dog that can already see. Why get another creature? It's, it's a myth that bats are blind, but let's play along. Why would you get another blind creature? Also, I've heard guano is not very good for you. Right. Yeah, but dog shit, fucking lovely. <laughs> All right, article number two. One of the oldest human remains in the New World, the remains in Tulum, Mexico, have been confirmed to be 35,000 years old. Both of you guys said that this was false, and this one is bad science. We have covered these remains many times before, even though they were only discovered less than five years ago. And you're going to keep subjecting our fans to this same fucking story over and over again. That's right. These are some of the oldest human remains in all the New World. Very, very neat. They're actually found underwater, and they were confirmed today to be 13,000 years old, which is really old for the New World. One of the reasons this is so impressive is those of you who know a lot about C14 dating know that it, you essentially run into a problem trying to C14 date anything that's been underwater. Especially if it's salt water, it can actually affect those readings, but also the collagen essentially gets eaten out by aquatic microorganisms, and it makes it hard to have anything to date in there. So what these researchers did is, one, they did the standard dating for the actual bones themselves, came up with a number somewhere between 11 to 14,000. It was really hard to tell. They couldn't narrow it down. But this particular bone actually had a stalagmite growing on top of it. They were able to go down into that stalagmite and see that the stalagmite actually captures elements of the atmosphere around it when it's being formed, when this cave was dry. They were able to show when these particular elements were at this concentration, at what time, and show that this had to be a 13,000-year-old bone because it captured the, literally the air and the environment from 13,000 years ago. It's a really, really cool, and as far as I know, the first time anybody's ever used this technique to date human remains. Really neat, some of the oldest stuff we found. And again, Tulum, Mexico, this is in the Yucatan Peninsula. This is not Alaska. This is not, you know, when people are just crossing in Factual. across across the bearing thing. Yes, no, this is all the way down in the middle of the continent. So we know that human beings kind of made it in here probably 20 to 25,000 years ago. We don't have remains that are that old. They made, and they made it down very quickly because we have sites down in the bottom of Chile that are 15 some odd thousand years old. 
like I said, we have older sites than this, but these are some of the oldest human remains. A lot of times the other sites will be things like stone tools. There'll be, uh, we, in the case of Oregon, we have coprolites, fossilized human feces. These are some of the oldest bones, the oldest actual remnants of human beings in the New World. Very, very interesting. So I think last time I was on here was when we had the Mastodon right. killing site. The fake Mastodon site, yes. Well, I was going to say, are, are there any updates on that? Um, no updates. I got a lot of hate mail for my criticism of that particular uh, site and then that particular write-up, which again was not a peer-reviewed published article. It was just a letter to nature. Uh, I can write a letter to them too. It doesn't mean that what I'm saying is true. And there was very little evidence to support what they were doing. And they brought in some questionable quote-unquote scientists. Well, they're real scientists, but with questionable means and motives to do the analysis when, in fact, there were much more qualified people who could have told him a little bit more accurately at what he's looking at. There's a lot of issues with that. If you want to hear more about that, you can go ahead and check out our website, www.thesciencefaction.com. There's a whole blog post on it that will break down the case point by point so you can kind of catch up to where we are on it. I have a question going back to your copper light thing. Uh -huh. Let's say I wanted to create a copper light yes. for a future archaeologists. Uh-huh. And you want to get fossilized human feces? Yes. Right. What I know, obviously, you know, I'm not going to do it in the toilet. Right. But I, do I do I want to bury it? Do I? Yes. Want... You want to uh, cover it in something that ideally has some calcium, some so some soil with some calcium uh, embedded in it. You want to get a lot of mineralization. So if you can cover it over immediately before the bacteria get to it, and then have the minerals seep into it, that's ideal. Especially if it's like a wet environment where the water can help the minerals seep in. So if you have like your grandma's or grandpa's ashes, just pour those over the pile. Yes. It's for science, grandma. All right, article number three. Researchers are baffled at the first documented case of a homeopathic magnetic hematite healing bracelet purchased at a market in Manchester, Connecticut, helping cure a disease. Both of you guys thought this one was false, and this one is, of course, bad science. As Ian pointed out, it did not help cure a disease as much as it gave a toddler lead poisoning. So indeed, a lot of times these type of things are put together by idiots. By definition, you kind of kind of have to be. It's a, it's a prerequisite. And they'll oftentimes use something like lead when they are making a bracelet for a toddler. I've seen earrings for babies, so that argument goes right out the window. Right. I mean, from Le Lead crowd. earrings that babies eat. Just because that's what you had, Damien. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and I, which is why, yes. Did it knock down a couple IQ points? Yes, it did. However... A couple? It's debatable. <laughs> However, I am more radiation resistant with more lead in me. That is true. You, have, you are less likely to be harmed by, by dangerous radiation. Um, it, it, what happened was, that, uh, as toddlers do, the toddler would suck on this bracelet, ended up getting lead poisoning, and they had concentrations eight times the marker for lead poisoning. So it wasn't like it just barely tipped, like, I got a little bit of lead poisoning. You got fucking lead poisoned. You got a lot of it. It was um, one half the average child in Flint. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with lead poisoning, it actually affects kids way more than adults. As an adult, you can actually take in quite a bit of lead, and it may have some impact on you neurologically. Um, probably will, but it's not a big deal. When you're a child, it actually affects your ability to grow a lot of those neurological structures and will have lasting impacts on on your mental capabilities, sometimes to a rather extreme degree. So this is actually, it's a, like a funny ha-ha joke, but it's actually kind of bad, because in a way, by, by causing brain damage to this child, we're just creating more homeopaths, right? Like there's just <laughs> somebody else who's gonna believe in that bullshit. Lead poisoning hits kids much harder, which is why kids are much more affected by gunshot wounds than adults. That is not why, but uh, all right. So, on, those have copper jackets. Yeah. <laughs> on to article number four, new research indicates that the most nutritious part of the avocado is actually the stem. Damien thinks this is false. Ian thinks this is true. This one is bad science for Damien's first win of the year. Congratulations, Damien. Number God, five and alive, and that's with the one you jacked from me. Uh, very, very good. Uh, in fact, uh, what they did find is that the most nutritious part is actually the sheathing on the pit of the avocado. So if you guys know, when you cut open an avocado, you have the pit in the middle, and it's got this kind of like skin, the sheathy skin on it. Well, what the researchers did is cut up a bunch of that stuff and put it into a mass spectrometer, and they actually found a bunch of anti-inflammatories, a bunch of compounds that we know inhibit cancer growth. There's a bunch of stuff that we think are actually probably quite good for you in those sheaths. So what do you do? You're not going to eat the pit, obviously, but when you do make guacamole the next time, you can scoop out the meat of the avocado and then pull that sheath off and pound it up, kind of grind it up and sprinkle it in there. It's actually going to help encourage the taste. You know, when you leave the pit in, it keeps it from rotting a little bit. Some of the chemicals, the preservative chemicals in the sheath are actually what do that. So it'll help keep your guacamole a little bit fresher. It'll also give you a little bit more, it'll give you way more nutrition per given unit of avocado that you're eating. So next time you make guacamole, 
Rip that sheathing right off that pit, grind it up, put it in the rest of the avocado. It'll help you out in more ways than one. And by sheathing, you just mean like the shell? Of no, this? it's like the skin of the pit. Like when you, if you think about it, when you cut right in, the pit itself is hard, but it's got a thin kind of brown shelly skin on the pit, pit itself. And that's what you want. I have a problem though. I follow the way of Bushido. And once I remove a pit from its sheath, I can't put it back till it's tasted blood. Right. Well, one, that is untrue. <laughs> And number two, the solution to that would just be to cut yourself, right? Every time, do you just cut yourself? I think that'd be a great deterrent against eating avoc avocados, or at least avoiding that sheath. Right, yeah, and also, people who, that whole rule where the, the guys have the knives that when they pull it out, they have to draw blood before they can put it back in, that just seems, like, cumbersome, or, and I thought of this before as, like, a technicality, couldn't you have a second sheath? You're like, it can't go back into that sheath until it tastes blood. So I'm going to put it in this other sheath and carry it around until I have some, some blood stuff to cut. I think these policies came about in a time when it was just easier to stab a peasant yeah. than to put it back in. Yeah, nobody was playing lawyer ball like I was with the knife rules. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Ian, for coming back for Science Faction 190. And thank you, audience, for coming back where you learned about Aurora Tungenesis, the Cretan hominid footprints, the British gas invasion how humans are able to perform echolocation, the age of some of the oldest human remains in the new world, why homeopathic bracelets can give you lead poisoning, and the most nutritious part of the avocado. Thank you so much for joining us. Please tell a friend and tweet us at Faction Science and come on back next week for Science Faction 191. You know, the main difference between you Yanks and us Brits is how you handle beachside gas attacks and cutting off the tips of your dicks. You've been listening to Science Fuction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs>